digital projects are coming along fine, especially for grad students. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are actually leaving for for the break and stuff. I think the the report is due the day after you guys get back, right? Um, and I want to see that people are making progress. So um, don't worry about the English. Don't worry about what you have. But I want to get a sense that people are doing something, right? Because um, we don't have too much time after that. I mean, practically after that, you don't have an open chunk of stuff and other classes and all will kick in and everything. Right? So if you have any issues, let me know as soon as possible so we can work on that. So how was the exam? I guess you haven't taken an exam yet, right? Right. Um, so. Do you want to go eat or something? I'm going to answer. Yeah, can you please? Okay. Yeah, sure. Everyone else has taken the exam, right? So I haven't looked at the, the answers yet, but how was it in general? Was it as expected? Uh, um, I tried to make it similar to the homework assignment, so it was not, uh, hopefully it was not stuff. It's meant to be vague because, uh, so I was not looking for the answer. I, I, I'm gonna create the midterm, so. So hopefully you can give me a sense of what what you know what what do you think about uh, sense network, right? I guess we can bring him up because unless you guys have any specific concern about any question. We didn't know big discussion. Right. So hopefully at this point you have a sort of an idea of what these <laughs> networks are, what what they what the problems are, and all those things. Right? And it, it still keeps evolving. Right? We had some papers at SOSP on sensor networks, and it's I think they're still trying to figure out what sensor networks are and kind of stuff. Right. Um, so the the second half I, I want to look at some real systems, and real systems that can do some interesting stuff. And um, I was talking to some of the people who are doing these different sensors. Right. Um, did you get a chance to talk to Matt Welch? Yes, was he with the poster? Yeah. With the, like, yeah. Like OS? Yeah. yeah. I talked to him and listened to his thing. And, yeah. So he had a post on what they were, con the working on that people, what they were doing with that, right? And it, you know, those networks are hard to use and everything. So um, before we do that, I want to wrap up this, this half of the course with the paper on how to reprogram them, right? It hasn't received a lot of, um, us, because it's 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 a sort of like a thankless kind of job, right? I mean, how do you reprogram these things? It's an important program, but not not the one as important, not as interesting for a lot of people, right? Luckily for us, Chris actually works in this area, right? So, um, can you give a brief like intro on what 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 do you do and uh, like what are the challenges and complications mm -hmm. like? that you you are facing that is not addressed by this work? Um, with, some of it, with theirs, they weren't, you can see they were extremely concerned with the timeliness of it. Um, they were basing a lot on the trickle, which is just sort of a, a low, or slow, but energy efficient way of just slowly propagating it out. Um, the timeliness could be an issue, so you may want to get it out there quickly, but of course, quickly the way to do that is just the, you know, all out flood, uh, which isn't good for typical sensor network application. You want to minimize it, energy uh, use as much as possible. Um, and then you have issues of um, versioning. Um, so you just want to make sure that, you know, if especially if there's mobility of nodes internally the network, that they all have a, the current uh, version that's out there. So you need some way of uh, broadcasting or uh, sending out information or making sure that nodes are aware of what the current versions are and that they're getting those versions. Um, and then I guess one more complicated way is, or issues is just uh, how to actually make the change over. So once you've got the new code, you need to switch over to the new version. Uh, you know, how do you do that? And do you switch all the nodes at once? And how do you synchronize that with all the nodes in the network? And if you have some nodes that are on the old version, some that are still waiting to update, you know, how do you handle packets that are that's okay, so yeah, it seems like some of the similar issues that they can they were concerned about. Some of them are different, right? Mm -hmm. um, they didn't talk about what happens if you have different versions and stuff, different versions of code, right? Um, so yeah, so 
they actually talk about an architecture they, they, they don't really care about how how you implement all the stuff their their goal is to say we are building an architecture where you can build these different ways of updating and all those things so they, they sort of like a kernel in you know kernel which provides certain things where you can build your own little kernel right so their approach is to use a, a virtual machine based uh, approach and um, so the, the reason why you want to do all of this is, you know, most of the sensor networks, you expect that once you deploy them, you will want to modify the code, and right? you want, want to change the, change the code that is running on these machines. So you will have to sort of send, send the code update kind of stuff, right? Um, and it's, it's especially more important because these systems, when you deploy them, you typically don't have idea what to look for. So if you, if you sort of deploy them and then reprogram them later on, that's a good thing. And especially if you can send code which will do filtering in the network, right? Yeah. Do aggregation, then you expect significant energy reduction because you you want to send a code which says what is the trigger, what what should be forward, that kind of thing. So you want a facility to program these things, you know, code these things, right? And this is an important challenge that is being faced throughout the distributed systems community, right? So if you have a cluster of you know 10,000 servers, how do you update them? Um, how do you manage them? Is this essentially similar kind of problems with the different resource constraints and all those things, right? And in sort of what Chris was saying, like what, how do you know which versions run and all those things, are also important in that scenario too. So if you have, if you have Google and you have a farm of like 10,000 machines, if you want to update the the server, right? How do you propagate that? How do you make sure that all of them get the same kind of stuff, right? And again, depending on what scenario you're working on, you all these systems have different kind of solutions. So if you have Google. One of the things that they, they, they are not worried about, so much about the version part that he was mentioning, was because their, their model is it's web, right? So if you search for some content, and if the first time you make a query, you get a slightly out, outdated data, that's okay, right? Because who, who really knows what is the newest data, right? So they don't really, really care about what version you get, as long as it's not like six months old, right? So if you search for my name and my CSE account comes in first rather than my ND account or vice versa. It's not considered to be a big, big issue, right? Whereas for other stuff, it's more important. So if you're doing a like shopping cart kind of things, um, it's more important. So if you if you add an item onto the shopping cart, and then by the time you check out, you see an older version of the shopping cart, that's probably not good for you, not good for the company kind of stuff. So they, the people worry about a uh, whole bunch of these issues. So one of the ways that people solve these things is to make these things active, right? Make the make something within the network active, and it's called active networks. So if you take a course in operating systems and networks on the gadget level, you go through some of these issues, right? So essentially, what you do is you make the routers run code. So I can so if I want to get a web page from uh, CNN, CNN sends some of the some of whatever they have to process into the network, and within the router within the internet there's processing and, and they do something. So CNN sends a piece of code, right, which maybe is rendering a, the, the way the document should look like, and that processing happens throughout the routers on the network. And the, essentially the problem here that you worry about is, how do I trust these routers? How do I make sure that these routers are running the right set of codes kind of thing? And similarly, people have done this on, on disk, right? Rather than getting the block data, have the disk do some processing and send me some data. So do they send part of your database code into the disk driver kind of thing. So this is along those same lines. So you, here you, what you are trying to do is, I send this code, I, I have some data, I collect some data, and I want to send this data with some code throughout the system. So I may send a, a packet to you, which essentially contains some data, some operation that you have to do. Right? So either you can do that yourself or, or send it on. So for example, if you want to find the aggregate temperature data, right? so I not only send the so I, I send a task into, into a system saying, I want the average. So every node, everything in the middle may do the part of the calculation. So they're sending the data and the code, right? So does that make sense? Okay. So th that's sort of what they, were, they would like to do. So the dis distinction between programs and the data goes away. So every node has access to the sense data, has access to other data, and it kind of keeps computing as it goes along. And that's what they want to achieve, and, and how they go about that is, is the thing. So they call it active sensors because it's a play on active networks, active disk, where the network is active. It's running these different codes, right?
So again, like the the, um, the the reason is to dynamically reprogram or, or send these code code uh, uh, objects. So they they, they got, go to a number of ways of how you do that. I mean, I think I think the essential contribution of this paper. How many of you read this paper? Right. What do you think of the paper? Was it easy to read, understand? Um, so uh, Chris, would you consider this to be a good representative paper in this field? Because I think this is the, the sort of the latest paper, right? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty representative. Sorry? Yeah, it's pretty representative. It seemed like there's a few different directions. So, mm -hmm. so like they focus on their related to resolve to like trickle and daily matters. Mm -hmm. different Which is not surprising because trickle was done by them, right? So one, one thing you learn is um, when you do paper one and then do paper two, right? Paper two typically kind of indirectly says that paper one was the best thing since sliced bread, which helps paper two kind of thing, right? So, um, yeah, I, trickle was done by, uh, I think, Phil Lewis, so it, it's obviously um, leads up to the thing. So, and, and sort of thing here, th these are the essential to the, the more main folks, so obviously it's, you know, di di driven by what they have, right? Um, I didn't find the paper to be ex extreme, very easy to read because I think it was very confusing, right? Like it was kind of confusing to see what they were really trying to get across, right? Because they're throwing in a whole bunch of stuff. It, it felt like they were trying to fill in a whole paper worth. I mean, like you could cut it into half and not notice what uh, was lost, right? So essentially the point is there's a number of ways you can do this stuff. So my goal is to somehow send a program which runs on a different machines and does some processing, right? So now, now, I, now I want to, say, write a different program which wants to find out, say, the number of nodes which are above a certain temperature threshold, right? So I write this little program which says if the temperature greater than something to account, I flood it and I want to get the answer, right? So I want the program to go to different nodes. So somehow I want the program to go to all the nodes and then run on all the nodes, collect all the data and get the data back to me. So the, the data, Transfer should be done by the program itself, right? And I, I need to do that and, and have different users do this stuff. So one of the issues that you want to worry about is the protection. So I don't want this this program to crash all the machines. So somehow I want this such that it's running as an application on the machine, on the node, and ha they have some sort of protection, right? So my program, even if it goes into infinite loop, would not destroy the system, right? And it's a problematic thing because Tiny OS does not really have a notion of processors. So somehow I need to have a mechanism where this is a protected piece of code that I send across, right? And there, you also have to worry about the heterogeneity of the hardware. So the hardware may, may have different architecture, though it's not clear what they actually did on that front, right? The, the, the approaches I can think of is I can write native code. I can write native Tiny OS code or, or, or whatever code, and that will run on all these machines, right? So if you're thinking of this as a regular machine, I'm running a new program and I'm sending the program executable to each of the nodes, right? So the way, so if you do that, the programs usually tend to be large, right? So if you write a program, if you, if you look at uh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint code tends to be fairly large, but it's flexible because the program can do it precisely what it wants. So I can either send the whole program to each node, right? Uh, which would mean that the, the program may take multiple packets, network packets, which may lead to some of the issues that you talked about. So if I want to forward it, right? Yeah, if it's a, say, 10, 10K kilobyte uh, program, right? And these nodes are small. So 10K means that there has lots of packets going across. If one of them gets lost, if the nodes kind of die or something in the middle, you don't get half the program, right? So that's one approach. The, the base approach is you can do it at the, as a native program. It'll be large. It'll be optimal. It'll be as fast as you can imagine because you can say code in like uh, assembly language or something, right? The other mode is to send a script, right? So if you, so essentially what you're trying to do is you you're putting some code on the machine, and a scripting language essentially lets you run those uh, tasks, right? So for example, if you're in your machine, if you say very simple kind of script, right? So if you want to send a script like this, then essentially you don't have to send too much code. Essentially you send this program to, this, to the, the script to the different nodes. 
And what essentially happens is this since essentially becomes a, a, a large piece of code, right? And broadcast means a large piece of code, which is on each of the machines. So each of the machines should know how to interpret this script, right? When I have reprogrammed, I only send this little stuff, but that means that each of the sensor has to have the corresponding code to run for each of the operation, right? Which means that I'm restricted to what I can do, right? So if the, depending on what sensor I have, this set of instructions tends to be limited, right? Because these sensors are, are small and everything. So I can't possibly have a case where the sensor can do all the things possible, have a rich scripting language, and still get the benefits I want, right? If, if it has to be rich, that means the, the script has to know about everything. It has to know about temperature, it has to know about any possible sensor you can have, it can. It has to do all the stuff. Uh, so the the more rich this is, the the bigger the code begin becomes, right? So that's a trade-off. So either you can you can have a pretty complicated stuff here, but then you can send a small set of uh, code, right? So this is the optimal in terms of how much code you have to send, but you have to pay the price for it in terms of the code, right? And again, if you want to do make it do something else that does not prepare for. Then you have to do a different sensing language and so on and so forth. So that's the next approach. Right? The approach is to have all the code in the, on all the machines and essentially write this little script which will do all the things. And as you have different applications, you make the script larger and larger, and eventually the script becomes like your VB script or one of those things, right? You can do everything, but it's pretty pretty hard. The other notion is to have is to write all the code on a virtual machine, right? And hopefully, have a translator from the virtual code to the regular code. So the virtual, so um, this is essentially a Java approach, right? So you're, you're running a virtual machine, right? And so you send a Java bytecode, right? And depending on how you define these instructions, this is lower level than what you sense here, right? This is lower level than what you have here. Uh, and Essentially, you fold this for different architectures. If you're running it on mode, mode two, and all those things, you have a different virtual machine, right? And the instructions here may, for example, tens may translate into five different instructions, right? And each of the five may translate into ten or twenty instructions on the different architecture, right? So this is a sort of like a trade-off. So essentially, you have this virtual machine, and you write code for the virtual machine. The virtual machine is, is a lower level. So all your the script operations would have translated to multiple instructions, right? And hopefully you can have different virtual machine for a different different uh, setup, right? If you're on, on a rich machine, you have different VM. If you're on a poor machine, you have different VM. So if, so for example, if you write Java code, the Java VM on your cell phone may be different than what you have on your uh, laptop, right? So the same bytecode may or may not work depending on what the VM has, right? So that's the approach they took in Mate, right? The problem, uh, the, so the, the other nice stuff is, once you do this, you can, you can have uh, isolation. So essentially you can say, all your programs run within this virtual machine, and your regular OS on the sensor can run multiple VM if it wants, right? And you could do that with the, with the scripting stuff too, if you want multiple script interpreters. But essentially this is, so this is between the native programming and the and the script language, right? And the, and the problem again here is, if you're so the VM has to be as powerful to do what you want, right? So <coughs> if the VM does not, so, so you would have to cut down the VM. So you would like to cut down the VM and make it targeted for a specific application, right? How I many of you use Java extensively, right? So you're aware of the the different VMs for mobile, you know, for your cell phones and laptops and stuff like that, right? So if you look at the program, so if you're writing a program for your uh, for your cell phone, right, it does not support certain operations, right? But your particular cell phone may not even support all the stuff that could be supported, right? So for example, the, 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 the one on a cell phone may support playing back video, right? It may make sense on, say, like an iPhone, which has like a screen and all those things, but if you have like a very simple phone which has no screen, basically has a thing to make a phone call. That phone still has to support the VM, Java VM, which does video, right? What you would like to have is 
different Java VM for different machines. So you can say that's a like a really low end uh, phone. So you'll have Java VM, you know, one. If it's like if it's slightly more Java VM two. You have a screen, then you have a Java VM for screen. We have screen with speaker, Java VM for speaker, and so on and so forth. So what you would like to have is a Java VM meant for each particular device, rather than having this broad class saying one for desktop, laptops, what what have you, and one for cell phones, right? And that's essentially what they're trying to do. So you, you want to have this facility to have virtual machines, right? And where you have the, the, the nice feature that since it's running under the VM, you can potentially run multiple of these, right? You would like to customize these VMs just for the applications. So if your node, uh, node is, happens to be running on a particular uh, task, you can, you can choose a particular VM to do that, right? So one way to solve this problem, which is what the cell phones tend to do, is when you buy the cell phone, right? When you look at the cell phone, they actually tell you what exactly they're they are running, right? So you, so you could you could go and buy different phones to get the right uh, VM. What they would like to do is be able to send this code along with this. So, so you as a programmer can say, I want to write a VM which is just tuned for my my code, right? This VM will only have instructions for, let's say, add, subtract, and broadcast, right? In the Java example, this would be, this will only have read, write, play audio, right? So if I'm going to listen to songs, if I want to send you a song, I send you this VM, and the song object, right? So if you run on that VM, it only knows how to read a file, write a file, and uh, you, can, you can even make it like read a file and play audio, right? So I don't have to worry about what you have in your cell phone. I basically send you this code to say, here's audio file. In order to play it, you have to know how to do read, and you have to know how to uh, play the audio. So I'm going to send this. VM to you and the um, and the audio file to you, right? And hopefully, somehow magically, this will be com compiled into the different architecture. So if you have a different phone, it'll get compiled, right? So I'm sending both the stuff to you so you can work with that, right? And that's what they're trying to do. So they, they're trying to define an architecture where I can do that, where I can say, for my virtual machine, for my task, I need certain primitives. I put them into the virtual machine. Then I write a script which will essentially be running on top of the machine to read, the, to do what I have to do, right? And it's tuned to the particular task. So I can send multiple uh, virtual machines to you. They're not defining what, how it should be done. They're, they're defining the, the architecture of how these things should be built. And once you get that, so you're supposed to build these VMs, and then you're supposed to build your, your script or program, right? This program would be a lot bigger than this script but a sm lot smaller than your regular program, right? And they, they show how they can do that for a couple of different languages and a couple of different applications, and they show the effect is not that bad, right? And specifically, what, uh, um, they, they focus on extensible type support, right? So the, the VM infrastructure provides type support that you can change for you know, the integer and uh, our, our floating points, stuff like that. It gives you concurrency control, right? Which essentially lets you run multiple threads without having to worry about locks, right? Because you know, when you're talking about little nobody don't want to provide uh, locks and stuff. So their their VMs they guarantee that you won't have issues with locking, and they also do code propagation. They they give a mechanism by which you can send code across the different ones. So if you're running one VM on one machine, it can infect another machine with the code update, right? And you can also do that where the packet sizes are, are larger. So the, the their VM substrate. So on the regular machine, you have this their VM. Yeah, the, the active VM running on top of the regular machine. So you'll run your custom VMs on top of this, and then the, the VM code, right, like a Java jar file kind of thing, which will run on top of this and. They'll provide the service and so on. 
So this service they provide one of them includes code propagation, right? So if you have another version of this program, it's up to the their VM to send the programs to different nodes, and they allow the, the facility to have the, the programs be larger than a single packet, right? Which means that if you have a program which is like 10 packets, right, they have to keep a, some sort of a cache of how they get, you know, as they get more packets, they have a to talk to other nodes to figure out which node, node to go. They have a no, version, notion of versions, not as rich as what you were uh, mentioning before, but I think trying to keep sure of what programs you're running. Right? The goal is not to make sure that all the programs are run the same version, but rather if I'm running one version, I'm getting a new program, I have to know what fragments I need to fill that version to get the next program. So I think it's pretty nifty what their goal is, right? If you've seen it in other contexts, so it's not it's not it's not a new context, but they're moving into the to this incident or case, right? The other context is the Java Java case that uh, you worked on, right? If you program in Java, you realize that it's important what JVM it runs, right? You can't just say I wrote a Java program and this is a Java program, right? You have to say what what VM you're targeting. So if you write wrote a program which does a lot of GUI and stuff and put it on a cell phone, it does not usually work, right? And then that's that's the problem they're trying to solve. So they, they want to make it as tuned for the particular machine as possible. So they give this some of the facilities, and you're supposed to build things on top of it, right? The challenge here is if they make this very powerful, right? If they give a whole bunch of services here, then it becomes so bloated that you don't want to do that. So they want it to be as small as possible, and then as pow powerful as possible, so you can build these VMs on top which will do some of this stuff, right? Does this remind you of something in, from operating system world? I, I don't think I, I went through this in undergrad class that much, but I think I, I did mention this, right? This notion of there's a hardware, and then there's something here, and then there's something which changes the stuff, right? Does it remind you of something? Microkernel, right? Microkernel is, is one thing that you tend to do that, right? You, you tend to have this, essentially you're trying to have this little kernel which provides some of these services, and then you're having these other kernels which, which does some other stuff, right? So, but you know, people call it different things depending on which, which level you are, right? So, so that, that's what they're trying to achieve. So they, they're trying to, so they're trying to convince you that their abstraction, the three services that they want to provide, extensible type support, concurrency control, and code propagation is strong enough for you to build these VMs, right? So they built two VMs. One is uh, uh, for two different languages, right? I forget what the, what the thing is. One for scripting language, one for SQL kind of stuff. So they're trying to show you, argue that their system is powerful enough by showing that they can do two different VMs, which can do two different tasks, and they're able to do that rather easily. Uh, and so, you know, you, you should agree that this is a good good mechanism, right? So that so I think the the whole muddy notion of this paper was they they kept mixing, they kept talking about how good the performance and all those things. But I don't think performance is all that important. I think the most important part is being able to provide this functionality. So you can you can write these VMs without knowing what you're doing. Uh, and just by the fact that it's a VM means that if one of your code dies, one of the VM dies, they can recover and keep going. So when you, if your system was running this one, if your mode was running this one, and if everything was going fine, your program VM would not destroy the machine, right? It won't make it unbootable. <coughs> unless, unless your active VM is dead, they can provide ways to get you know, restart the stuff. And I think one of the things they do is if you get a new program, it'll um, reset the old one, then start a new one, right? Does that make sense? So in that context, I think it's, it's kind of nifty, right? That what they're trying to do, but I think, I think it's like, it's sort of like pulling teeth out of the whole thing, because I don't think they actually say what they want to do. They, they, they keep going off into low level details, like. How do you give the app codes for these different VMs, right? And those are all the details of how do you do the app codes, like how do you make these VMs work, right? So the the app code essentially means that, for example, if you want to do a sense, right, it may mean 
number of different tasks, right? So you could create, the idea is this, right? When you're running a your VM, right, it has to provide a number of instructions, right? Which is how your program is going to be uh, written, right? So if the if you want to do like say sensing, right? If you make that as a basic instruction, that means you can write a program which says sense and that's it, your program is done, right? But you don't want to do that because then it's like so specific, right? So what you may want to do here is stuff like let's say enable port or something, right? Enable port um, to be So it's up to you to figure out what are the functions that are absolutely necessary for your work, right? So if you do this, then what you may end up doing is sense may mean doing this, right? And set may mean um, so sense sense may translate into enable the disable and and set some state, set some uh, set or move or something, right? May mean you do enable, right? And disable, right? So that, that may be two things you want to do. So if you want to uh, sense means like create something from a particular device, and set means set something to the device. So for both of them, you may have to enable the device, you may have to wake up the device. You may have to do your read or write operation. You may have to close the stuff. So if you can move, so if you see this, then it may make sense for you to say these these four would be the instructions on your VM, right? So when you write the code, your code will be like this, right? In a scripting language, it may look like this, but on the VM code, this will be like this, right? And the details of how you do that. Right? So essentially, you don't send enable. So you actually have like a um, some kind of a table which says Enable would be call one, and let's say read is call two, and disable is call three. Right? So your code would would be could be something like one, two, three. This is enable. This is read. This is disable, and this is write. Right? So which means that when you when you when you write this program, you may have to say one, two, three with some arguments, right? argument to do some stuff, and that, that's essentially what the paper was going through. I mean, they're saying op code and the operand and what you're trying to do. So when you send a program, you send something like this, right? So you send something that says one, two, three, and then you know one means that's the operand, that's the enable operation, you perform that. So your program looks small, you have to do this translation and all those things, right? And that's the details in the paper, which uh, yeah. you're free to look at it. It's sort of more of a compiler, Kind of stuff. I mean, if you have taken a compiler, those those things seem obvious, right? So, what? So, th does that make sense? Right. So, what do you think now? Of how how um, is it? Does that seem like a good mechanism to? Is that an important problem to worry about? So, if you were to write a code on these sensors, then you have to somehow generate these VMs, and these VMs keep going around, right? And if machines don't really care anymore because if you send a new VM that they they don't really trust, they just get it, they just run it, right? All they have to have now policy is to kill VMs, right? For whatever reason, if you're taking too much resources, kill the VM. But the machine should still be up and running, right? You should not have a crash in the system at all. So if your program is failed, all you do is you do a patch, you create a new VM, you send it out. Right. Would that solve all the problems? Actually, you you have to disagree, right? Yeah, I mean it's very useful. That the whole propagation part of the paper isn't you know, anything too novel. Or, uh, I mean, there's other ways to do it, but yeah, just the, having the whole lower level active mm -hmm. VM that always prevents you or always allows you the opportunity to reprogram and not have the no lockup is important. Mm -hmm. very important. No, 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 so I'm asking the context of like I'm saying you have to trash this, right? Because 
if you're working in this space, <coughs> you're working on something which is better than this one, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, which part of their work don't you like? Uh, I'll say, yeah, I think they're, they're not adding a whole lot like, to the propagation and distribution of the code mm -hmm. from that part of it. So, uh, I think there's, uh, there's I think no, no, no. there. It's just better, more efficient, and uh, effective mm -hmm. ways to distribute the code to different nodes. Mm -hmm. So, how often do you expect this to? So, so yeah, one of the one of the constraints is like they send the code as fragments, right? And and they, they make a big deal that you don't have to send it in one packet; you can send it in multiple packets, right? But I don't think they clearly expect you to send like a million packets, right? Your program they expect it to be not one packet, maybe like four packets, right? Right. That that's my sense of so the 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 policy is designed for like say four packets right so if you don't get up so if you create a program happens to be four packets look they keep track of how many fragments have been received right so if they have received this they haven't received any of this they wait so if they talk to a new sensor first thing that they um, they chat with each other is like what version you have so they, they don't really care whether it's new or old. They just want to know that whether you have this particular version. If you do, then your node will ask for, uh, can you send me two, three, and four? And if the other send, send, sends me three, I uh, I keep track of it. So eventually, I hope that some sensor would send me all the two and four, and I have the program that I can run, right? And I think that's that's the that's the extent to which they do code propagation, right? So one of the awful stuff is if your program only change a little bit you still have to send the whole fragments. They have no notion of deltas and stuff, right? So if you create a new VM, which essentially is one, two, uh, three prime and four, right? I don't think they have a notion of the primes. It, they, you still, it treated it, like a new stuff, you send all these four uh, objects, four fragments, right? So clearly this is an awful solution if you're trying to send programs often, right? And clearly this is awful if you have like a million entry here, because you have to, do lots of, it's going to talk a lot kind of stuff, right? And, and they, they make some arguments about why these don't matter, right? So, one of the, so why do you think this this approach is reasonable? I mean, I think they had a paper, the trickle was in the previous uh, census, I thought, right? Trickle was in census 04, right? Which is where they define all this, like how, how they do this trickle stuff, right? When would this be a problem? One 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 case I gave you, like you know, if the program is rather large, this is not a good problem, a good, good, good solution, right? Where is another time where you don't really care about the stuff? Or why would you care about the stuff? You got a real time system. Okay. If, you're, if you have concerns about the expediency and latency of getting to all the nodes, this doesn't really care. Okay, so yes, I think that's the key, right? So the the if you want the sense that this thing to be updated immediately, then you have to do something else, right? And if you want, if you expect the updates to happen often, you have to do something else too, right? Because I think if you expect the updates to happen once or twice in a lifetime, this seems to be okay, right? And I think they use that in other cases too, right? One of the one of the things they find is. If you go through this approach, their VM approach, rather than the native code, it's six percent slower, right? But they say that's okay because sensors, for the most part, are doing nothing. They're both sitting all the time doing idle. So instead of doing it in one second every day, instead of use being used for one second every day, it doesn't matter if it's 1.06 seconds every day, right? Do you buy that? Do you guys buy that? This is it's slower, but it doesn't matter really because sensors are not doing much anyway. So it's a little so slower, right? That that's the main claim. I mean, I didn't think that they had to say that because they can just say it's six percent and leave it at that. But they actually said even the six percent does not matter because most of the times the sensors are not doing anything, right? Yeah. It seems kind of wrong if you're doing something like earthquakes and. The other, you know, when you have a period of very active. Mm -hmm. So if you're losing data, and I guess the real problem would be if some of the sensors were maybe slightly 
Yeah. 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 And then and you lose in gay or can't correlate the data very well, then that would be very important. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that they didn't talk about is what Chris brought up, right? So if you if they are going with a model that yeah, since they're opening gonna be up for a for once a day or something, then yeah, I mean you can only propagate at a very slow pace. So um, don't expect the systems to propagate things rather quickly, right? And I think in their similar in their actual implementation, like some sensors which are off, were constantly trying to get these updates. They were trying to um, wake up and ask for other other. I mean, they're, they're making a broadcast request, right? And they kind of lost it all. But essentially, I think that's what is happening, right? Like some if you are some sensor, you wake up, you don't you don't have the last packet, right? If every other sensor is waking up you once a day. Then essentially you are left waiting for the time when they come on, right? I think they had a bug where they kept asking, but you won't find anybody because these these are not coming on, right? So the consequence of their decision, I mean, their argument that these things don't wake up all that much would mean that if you so you you should try to send it in as few packets as possible. If you send a lot of packets, then it'll take you days or so to get all the the data, right? Um, but then they'll argue that that's a separate problem, right? Because that's a separate paper they had. I mean, that's just in the previous census, so you know you can you have to trash that paper kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, some design decisions are obviously wrong, and uh, you would you would want to work on that. Um, and you know, Java VM. I think I don't I don't know if they actually said that, but Java VM is considered to be too expensive, right? Java VM essentially means that you have one VM to, to do it all, right? So you can install a Java VM on these sensors, and you basically send a new code. So here, um, they want it to be customized for each application, and you send that, right? Do you buy that, that component? Do you think it's necessary to have one VM per task? Or do you think it's better to have one VM to do it all? And mate, mate, of course, was kind of not powerful enough, right? So let, let's say you can put like Java VM through some mechanism, right? Yeah. It seems to be more reliable to have one VM. And it seems to actually be the VM if it's just one. If you're doing a VM for each application, it seems like you just have another layer to each application. And it's mm -hmm. not really all that useful. So are you concerned with how do you debug these VMs? Right, because it's either there's a bug. I mean, if there's a bug in the VM, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? But if it's at least a tested VM, you might have at least communication or other low-level things that you could use to update bugs and programs or mm -hmm. something like that. Does that, that, that make sense? I think, I think you, you had two different things, right? Um, one is the program, program bugs. The other is bugs in the um, being able to see if an order is out. Right. The, yeah, the program bugs. So the argument is, if you have one Java, let's say Java VM, right? let's say compare Java VM, right? If you have one Java VM, then you can have the Java VM. So it's a standard. So you have you can trust it right against any VM, and you, you hopefully it will work, right? Um, the other I think concern you had was, if a machine is not functioning. To debug, it has to have the facilities. I think as part of the VM, right? So, for example, ping, right? So, ping is one way to find if a machine is up. So, essentially, you send a packet to the machine, and it'll send back something to say, "I'm here," right? So, that functionality is part of your machine. It's not part of your application kind of thing, right? So, in this scenario, if you wrote a VM which only supported enabled port, read port, disabled port, and write port, and you want to debug by sending it some packet kind of thing. Unless it was part of your VM, it won't have the functionality, right? Which may be a good thing or a bad thing, which means that your, your code is as lean as possible. But you have to do, I mean, you have to send the, you have to build all this stuff. Even, even, even stuff as low level as thing, it has to be part of your VM, right? So if you don't, if you forget to implement something fundamental to monitor these things, um, there are no standard facilities provided by the system. So, they only provide the you know, type control concurrency and uh, code propagation, I think some level of broadcast and stuff. So debugging your application itself becomes hard. It's all part of the stuff, right? right? Yeah, I was going to say, if you have six VMs, 
just because one is working doesn't mean anything about the other five. Yeah. So it seems kind of dangerous to, you can't really communicate. If you only have ping in one, you're going to create six, <coughs> six different pings each VM to see if that VM is working or you, you should, right? right? Yeah, that yeah. seems to be kind of counterproductive too. That just adds more code when you could just have one thing. Mm -hmm. How many how many VMs do you expect in a in a typical sensor? I know it's a lot of question because you don't know what sensor is, but right. like in in a what kind of sense, uh, sensing or something, right? How many how many VMs would you suspect it'll have? Small number under ten, I would think. And it's just communication and ten? Under ten, like yeah. maybe five. It's just doing communication and power management and things like that. So how many how many uh, do you think will happen for the star bug, right? That's the, the underwater thing, right? The moving hammer, right? Oh. <laughs> right. I would say the machine the actual robotic thing. The Amor is the one which is like going up and down. Uh, okay, right. Yeah. The, the other one is the one that's yeah, like that going that right. Yeah. Air I think Amor also had propellers, right? There's propeller right. going right. back and forth and move up and down and all those things, right? How many applications would that be running? Do you think at least several times? Yeah. So <coughs> the, the the question is, in that machine, right, would you be better off with one VM which it does it all, or would you be better off with having multiple VMs? So what 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 is the driving force behind this multiple VMs? Why do you why do you want this multiple VMs? And when do you win with a multiple VM uh, rather than a single VM? When you're switching code, if you have if you want to take some code off and some code on, you can just change those packets, the program packets. Mm -hmm. But it seems like with the more things that has to be a static job. So it's not gonna kind of be changing its job, so you should probably have one. Yeah, it seems like if you, the total memory of you know, VM1, VM2, VM3, and the VM, right? And when this becomes smaller, I think you would want to just go with a single one, right? You have lots of tasks, if you want to create a, a VM for each task, right? At some point, you're you're gonna overflow this stuff, right? I think that's that's what happens in Amor, right? Amor expected to be doing a lot of stuff. I mean, it is propelling forward, backwards, and spinning and going up to get the GPS reading. May or may not be, right? It's it's doing that, it's seeking, um, tracking, magnetometer, and all those things, right? It probably has multiple different applications. So. Um, if when you find that the number of VMs you have kind of proliferates, and each VM adds its cost of, each VM is still replicating some other code, right? So if two VMs are replicating the same code, and eventually at, at some point, this set of things will become more complicated than a single VM, right? So I think it works for the more made case, right? I'm not sure how, how far you can take it, right? I, I think the amount of case it may not work. Um, Clearly, it's better than far better than mate because mate, from their description, seems pathetically underpowered, right? I mean, it doesn't have enough memory. I think it does operating on like very small memory size and stuff. Um, so it, it it has functionality in certain size scenarios, but I think in the case of the, the, you know you probably don't want to do this for a lot of stuff, right? On a different context, there's there's a push to do similar approach for <coughs> regular machines too. Um, there, there are companies which are popping up, which essentially wants to do, put each of your application in a single VM, right? So when you, when you get uh, PowerPoint or something, PowerPoint will learn it in its own VM <coughs> kinds of stuff, right? In the desktop scenario, and uh, it, it's meant to be seen how that is useful, right? But essentially, that, that's what you're trying to do. You're, you're trying to avoid having this one big VM. If you have one VM which can do everything, then you're fine. If you otherwise, you're trying to have these customized VMs, and hopefully, the <coughs> VMs. You don't have too many of them, 
and then I can independently change them. So I can make them customized for whatever. So once I have this, then I can send this VM to you and you run it. Um, and the only thing they provide is if you get a new code, and it will kill the old code, whatever it is doing, and then run for the new code, right? So what happens if your VM uh, goes into infinite loop? One of your VM goes into infinite loop, right? In which case, for both? Hmm? In which case, for both in or? In, uh, in, in the approach. Presumably their VM manager could kill it. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they would kill it, right? They probably would, so. Because it, like at the VM manager level, you don't know whether it's the desired property or not desired property, right? So um, if you go into infinite loop, then you'll kill the machine. But that's they can't decide what you should be doing, so they have to do it, right? The only way you do, they let you do that is if you get a new code, then it kills the old code. Um, but otherwise, it'll let you um, kill yourself. So the, the specific actors that they're, they're, they're talking about is they have the notion of a template, right? So you, you specify a template, and you specify what are um, primitives and what are functions, right? Primitives are, are things like add, subtract kind of things, and functions are something like random, you know, get a random number, which uses the primitives to make some computations for you. Um, so within a, within a virtual memory template, you are allowed to have your own functionality for different stuff, but they provide three different stuff. One is the, the scheduler, right? Um, and the concurrency manager and the capsule store. Scheduler runs the different threads, right? It can do the different threads in a FIFO fashion. And the concurrency manager makes sure that, so when you get a new, um, new, new thread, it knows what resources it's going to use, right? So if it looks like it's going to, so the code does not have to lock anything. It only will, will schedule you if you want concurrently request the same set of objects, right? And the ca capsule store essentially does the code propagation. Right? So somehow when, it, when they talk to other sensors, they get the, the code. Um, so the, the code for this, this, this program, this uh, program others are stored in the, the capsule store. And the data model is it's a, it's a stack-based architecture, right? Which means that if you get your new VM, you get your own stack, and you, you can store items in your stack. Essentially, as stack is your local variables inside your stuff. There are no notion of global variables, right? If you want global variables, you can implement that. Since they have no global variables, um, locking and unlocking is entirely up to you, right? There's no notion of global variables. Your code, you, you have access to a stack, and you, you can do whatever you want in your stack. Um, the, the scheduler is a FIFO thread scheduler, and, then they, and they go through details of how, you know, how they do the, the scheduling. Um, and the concurrency manager is a key here on why you don't need locking. So essentially, it knows the, um, so when you give a handler, so it, it essentially it's an event-based system. So when an event happens, right, event like, you have more data to read and more data to sense. Um, your thread begins ready to run, and your concurrency manager would not let it run till it has all the resources that it wants, right? So that way, when a code runs, it has all the resources, so it, there's no uh, locking issues, right? So if you have two threads, they can be overlapped, but since they can only run when they have all the resources, there can be no locking issues. Um, so that's the nice part. So that makes your coding simpler, right? Now, now, you, now you don't have to worry about locking because locking is, comes to you for free. Essentially, you don't run till you have all the resources, right? And it, it works fine in the case because you don't, you don't really, you shouldn't really have that problem too much, right? It won't work in a regular system because you actually do shared code. Here, they don't expect uh, two threads operating on the shared, same shared code. And the other thing they do is when you get a new piece of code, it reboots the old code. Right? In which case, all the variables may be lost in, unless you transmitted them, but that's okay because that also helps them debug their uh, system. Right? Um, and one of the one of the other stuff with the with the capsule propagation is they propagate the code to everybody, right? And only some nodes get to run that, right? So the idea here is. You have, like, say, 
four sensors, right? And you want sensor one and let's say two, three, four. You only want the art sensors to run this code, right? So you want this one and this one to run the then the code, right? So they have to send this VM. They only need this, right? But what they essentially do is the VM is sent to everybody, right? And only this and this choose to run it. The others don't run it, right? Why would they do that? The way they, they propagate is through broadcast, right? So essentially, this one will do a broadcast, and go in the page can get it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's using about the same energy to get it to everyone anyway, mm -hmm. and they may need it in the future, so then you don't have to go through the process of resending. Yeah, they may need it in the future. And also, I think the other other nice property is if you implement the policy that everybody gets it, gets to keep a copy, right? That means if the range is only to here, right? You can still propagate to here, right? Because you're, you're basically you're not trying to send it to a specific node. You're broadcasting to everybody, right? So these nodes don't really want it, but they can keep it and then forward it to others, right? If you make a policy that only nodes which have to run it should keep the copy, and they'll destroy it, and they'll destroy it, that means you have to somehow get it from here to here. You have to do all those other stuff, right? So right now every node will every node can potentially have it. So they they become forwarders for the whole code. Um, and also, if you want it in the future, you have it, right? But I think, I think their main, one of the main goal is to, you need more routers to send this code to you, so you know, why not have the functionality, right? So the code is trickled to the nodes using the version packets. When, 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 when the sensors, so they, the, the, the code component, distribution component has three different packets. One is the version, one is the capsule status packets, and, and the, um, there is the capsule fragments, not capsule. Right? So essentially, um, when, 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 the sensor, when you get a sensor, so you can tell you what package it has, and you can first, when the, when the sensor comes up, you can say what version it's running, right? And you can tell you what package it has, and you can use that to figure out what it needs and send those packets to you, right? And you send those using fragments, right? So using those three ones, which is essentially the trickle algorithm publish a separate paper, they forward this this code, right? It's pretty simple, it doesn't do any compression or whatever, so it, it sends a raw code. And so it can have more than one the, the program can be more than one fragment, but not not too large. Right? So yeah they, 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 they go through the evaluation. I think I think you know you, you should read it if if that sort of thing interests you. Right? Essentially they implemented two different stuff. One is a tiny script and one is more telly, which essentially means that, so you build a scripting language which calls the different local things, like, like I said. So if you, you build a scripting language, it says it supports the thing called sense, which essentially would call these VM calls, right? So they built one such language uh, that's not tiny script. The other one is, uh, tiny script is similar to basic, with the, which has dynamic type, type changing. Um, but no global variables and more LLE is similar to C like language. Right? So you, you write a code in that script. So essentially, you send that scripting code, which will get interpreted by that VM to run on the local machine. Um, and they build two applications. One is Regents VM, which which tells which for surveillance kind of application, and the other one is Query VM, which does that <coughs> tiny SQL kind of stuff. So essentially, now you're sending this, you're sending a query and a VM which implements that query on each of the machines. So you're running a tiny uh, SQL engine on each node where it goes by taking the code with it, right? So that is a good thing. I mean, that shows that it's flexible enough to, to do all this. So, so you, you, can, you can take this to other cases. Um, it's, it's relatively six, you know, it's relatively fast. I mean, it's 26 percent relative to the um, the hard-coded version, which, like they said, it, it's 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 not a problem because um, they, they, these are not expected to run often, right? And they showed that doing this will give you 20% energy saving, right? Um, 
essentially by by doing the processing on the other side rather than sending the raw data. So now you can send. So now I, I pay a cost of sending this code to you, but hopefully the, this code will only send me less data in the future, so that can uh, save me uh, energy. Right. So essentially, um, that so th this is, the paper is kind of different than that we will read. Uh, it's a very important problem, and you know, like as uh, Chris, Chris was pointing out, um, it's gotten less focus from other community. But I think right now it's also catching up in the regular uh, operating system community. How do you propagate this? How do you you know, send send code code modules across to different ones, right? Um, in the larger context, it's become very important because if you're if you're talking about a cluster of like hundreds of thousands of machines, and you want to send a single code, you want some of those machines to do some task for you, you would rather create these kind of notions, send the code to all these machines, so they can they can act like they're your machine, right? Um, so you don't worry about this the storage space kind of things, but you so for example, if you want to have hundred uh, Linux machines, right? So you create 100 Linux VMs, send it to those different machines, uh, which is running your version of Linux, so they can do the give the service for you, right? So there's a lot of focus research on, on, on these kind of topics. Okay. So any, any comments on this, on what they what they've done? Like I said, if you have any, any questions with your, especially a project over the break, um, I hope uh, people you know, make good progress over the break. Again, I'll be gone from Wednesday on the break till Sunday, um, but I should have email access, so you know, email and what have you. So. There are no questions, Nikki, we can see you guys after the fall break. Kind of thing, right? like a drone flying over this uh, area, and those tend to go faster, so you don't you don't get as much coverage. So you would like to do this hovering that you can do underwater, right? And turns out underwater is a lot easier because of the the way the buoyancy works, um, and over air it's a lot harder because you probably may know from Air Force kind of perspective, right? But they said it's very hard to send fly these things. Right? The doesn't scale down very well. Uh, you don't con you're, not, you're not able to control it very well. Um, so it, it works if you have something sort of like what you see on the the football game kind of thing, like the big blimp. They are lot easy to control because they are very big. They are more stable, um, but it's not very practical to fly something like that humongous. Um, so some of the stuff that you can do underwater may not be able to do above water. So. And I'm not too sure about the animal perspective either. You know, even zebra sounds awful if you think about it. But um, fish, I don't think you want to strap things on it. But it changes how they f swim too. So you don't want the the fish to swim slower because they are doing this sensing for you, right? Um, so essentially, so but that kind of covers all the the system. So for the for the midterm. We'll cover all these concepts, right? So so far, like if you if you look at the you know, wrap up of what we covered so far, if we looked at the, the book and we saw a lot of the traditional way of people how people define sense networks. And you talk about scalability, energy conservation, small size, cost, and so on and so forth. And we looked at a number of different scenarios. And I don't think any of the scenarios really worried about scalability yet, because scalability is not something you have to worry about till you make this thing work. If your if your range you can communicate is like meter and so on and so forth, you're not so worried about scalability at this point, right? And these scenarios cover the sort of the active areas people are working on. So there's the, the issue of habitat monitoring, the Duck Island uh, experiment where we looked at, 
the main thing they were worried about is longevity, right? You want to keep it for nine months or so. Um, and it turns out the longevity does not, the, the, the main concern 